So, ladies and gentlemen, very much welcome to this evening, all distinguished guests and members of Travelers Clubs. I have the great honor to introduce the speaker tonight, John Walsh, and you've really been deep down, Somewhere. so to say. And it's going to be a pleasure to hear about that. And we are also very grateful that you really came up again. That's it, yeah. Because if not, we would have a problem here tonight. That's no problem. <laughs> okay, so please go ahead. The floor is yours. Thank you. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Am I on the air here? Robert? Turn. You can hear me? Okay, thank you. I see some hands waving. Well, he's quite right. I mean, uh, we, we defin one definition of ocean engineering, the kinds of things that I do, is to dive in the ocean. Many people have gone to the bottom of the ocean. It's getting back up is the trick. And I define that as ocean engineering. So that's what I am. I'm sort of an ocean engineer. Tonight, uh, very briefly, this won't be such a long program because I don't want to get between you and your dinner. Uh, uh, we are going to visit the bottom of the sea. And uh, yes, a lot of it's history because I made this dive a half century ago, well, 53 years ago. Uh, but there, uh, because we were the first people ever to do this, there was only one program in France, the French Navy, that had a similar deep diving submersible. And so if we wanted to get everybody together that knew anything about uh, this kind of work, exploring the deep ocean in manned submersibles, we could just book a table for 10 people, a restaurant, and we'd all be there, and that was that. So we kind of wrote the book over those years, those early years, like the first years of aviation, where we, uh, if we needed something, uh, you couldn't just look in a catalog and find a vendor to sell it to you. You, uh, you had to design it and build it. So everything we touched was new. Uh, underwater cameras, lights, uh, other kinds of uh, submersibles, uh, unmanned submersibles. All of this was the stuff of which we uh, created our programs. So what I'm saying basically in longhand there is that our fingerprints are on all of the today's systems that work in the deep ocean, whether they're manned or unmanned. Because in the future, of course, we'll belong to the robots, the unmanned vehicles going into the deep sea. But there'll always be room for man. And of course, we could have an entire uh, university seminar on why man. I mean, we know it in space. Why can't you send monkeys up? Why can't you send robots? And you know, it's like when you talk to your children and they argue with you and they say, why, mama? And you say, because. And that's just because. I, for me personally, when, we, uh, when uh, Neil uh, Armstrong and, and Buzz Aldrin went to the moon, uh, that was something. Uh, it went, you know, the United States sent up an unmanned vehicle to the moon. It came back with some samples. That's fine. Uh, I didn't even go outside and look at the moon. But I know there's two of me up there. I went out and I studied the moon. I, that was pretty great to me. That's because. You, there's no mathematical formula or anything else that can explain why man should go. I think Jim Cameron, I was on his expedition, and we'll see some of that in a minute, in 2012 said it very well in one of the talks I attended with him. And that is, uh, he simply said, what kid wants to grow up to be a robot? We have to go, man has to go explore personally. But as I said, the heavy work will be done by unmanned vehicles. Well, that, these are kind of like parish notices, you know, before the, the church service. I need, need to get that out. Let's now look at uh, the, the program itself. We, ah, good. Some of you understand <laughs> the irony in all of this. Uh, we could put the lights down. I don't know if the TV people need or camera people. It doesn't bother me. I don't use a script or anything. Uh, it's probably obvious to you. Uh, <laughs> The problem here is that you sit at an opaque interface and try and divine what's going on. The total volume of the world ocean is uh, 360 million, I'm going to not go metric, excuse me, 360 million cubic miles. 360 million cubic miles of volume of the world ocean. You could take all the population of our planet, what's six billion now, and put them in one cubic mile of ocean. So that gives you an idea of this immense volume. But if you're sitting at this interface, this opaque interface, you don't really have an idea of all of that. What's down there? What's underneath? And in the classical way of doing ocean science, you used a ship and you lowered things in the ocean like artificial eyes, cameras, uh, grabbers, sensors, and you brought up stuff and you tried to explain to people what's going on down there. It's like 
um, drifting across Sweden uh, in a in a uh, in a hot air balloon or a balloon of some sort at night with clouds below you and lowering down some kind of claw device and bringing up samples and uh, putting them in your basket and then you go to some spa and give a learned paper about the the flora and fauna of Sweden. Uh, there's some uh, codfish, yes, a lot of codfish, uh, policemen, lots of policemen here, and this kind of thing. And that's how we did ocean science for uh, nearly 100 years, because the first formal uh, oceanographic expedition was in about uh, 1874, the Challenger expedition. So uh, this is, will always be, that is using the classical oceanographic ship, which this is not one, uh, to do a lot of the work. But you also have to go inside the ocean to make direct observations. Uh, the first hydronaut, if I may use that term, was Dr. William Beebe, who was a zoologist. And he, uh, in 1930, developed a bathysphere, bathy meaning deep, sphere ball, which was lowered from a surface ship. Um, let's see, here it is. Well, it's not a very good, I won't do that. This, this sphere here was a cast steel sphere, two people inside, lowered by a cable from a ship. And in 1934, he actually made a dive to a half mile down in the ocean near Bermuda, about 3,400 feet. And uh, this was really something for its time. But uh, after that, he did no more uh, uh, deep diving. He went back to studying butterflies and birds and things. He was, he was a naturalist. He was interested in everything. But for four years, he explored the inside of the ocean. He wrote a wonderful book called Half Mile Down. And for those of you inter interested in such things, you can still get copies of it in uh, antiquarian bookstores. And there's, there were so many published that they're rather reasonably priced. And he was quite, a, uh, quite an artist. He was a little bit like, like the, uh, the American scientist uh, uh, who, who helped define the science, uh, the, the space for all of us. Uh, tell me his name, please. I've forgotten it. Uh, uh, you know, the TV personality that uh, studied space. What was his name? Uh, Yes, Carl Sagan, right, thank you very much. Carl Sagan could draw, he could explain things, he was, had a good on-screen, uh, on-camera personality, and this was the Carl Sagan of the oceans in the 1930s. Now, <clears throat> this rather curious looking fellow, you see uh, hunched over his desk, that's Professor August Picard, a physicist. And he was uh, very well, and that's his son Jacques in the upper left hand corner who we'll meet later, that's who I worked with. Professor uh, Picard was a very distinguished physicist and his specialty was measurement. And he was interested in, in cosmic radiation uh, in the early 30s. And he climbed the Alps and the numbers just weren't good enough because the Earth's atmosphere is kind of like a filter and he had to get higher. So how did he do it? He got a balloon and went very high in the sky. And as, when he was doing this balloon work, he was really borrowing on some of his earlier experiences in the Swiss Army. It was 1904 when he was a student at the Zurich Polytechnic University. He was a, 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 a officer in the reserve in the balloons. And so he understood this technology very well, but only applied it later on uh, in the 1930s to explore the upper atmosphere. But in 1904, he really began with this funny looking device on the left. I'm sorry. Let's come up here one more time. There. At which he called a bathysphere, it's bathyscaph. Bathy meaning deep, scaphos boat. And he was, when he, was, uh, he was ill for a while. He was in bed and was reading through the uh, reports of the German meteor expedition in the mid-Atlantic from the late 1800s. And he thought to himself, well, I know how balloons work. Why can't you have an underwater balloon? Same idea, fly underwater, independent of any tether, because that was the problem with Beebe's bathysphere. You can only lower so much cable in the ocean and it'll just pull apart from its own weight. So uh, he developed this notion of the underwater balloon, the bathysphere, bathyscaph, excuse me. And, but before he could do that, before he could perfect that, he got busy in his field of science, I mentioned earlier, cosmic radiation, so that in uh, night, dear me, in 1930s, in the 1930s, early 1930s, for about 36, he made 27 flights 
in balloons to make those measurements. And he set a world's altitude record of some 70,000 feet in 1936. That's pretty high even today. But back in those days, what, what there was in the field called aviation medicine, they said if you, if you flew higher than 25,000 feet, you'd surely die. A uh, man can't go any higher than that, it's, that's it. So he had a hard time getting somebody to build the capsule for his balloon, to you know, his personnel capsule, except he found a brewery in Belgium that fabricated, could fabricate uh, aluminum beer barrels, large ones for a, a brewery. And so he sent them the specification for a rather unusual uh, uh, barrel for the beer. It had openings in it, and a door, and all that. They, they didn't question it. They just thought it was a, some kind of special brewery. And that's how Picard got his uh, capsule. So, world's record. But it wasn't to set records that he did this. He was a scientist. And he wanted to get good numbers. And that's what he was getting by going so high. But he never forgot the idea of his bathyscaphe. And so he and uh, William Beebe, in this sort of cartoon from New Yorker magazine, Beebe down there and Picard up here, cross paths in New York City. They were both on the lecture circuit, talking about their records that they'd set. And this inspired uh, Picard to resume his idea of the bathyscaphe, because he saw what Beebe was doing. He could understand the limits. In other words, you can only lower so much cable under a ship. And if you really wanted to go in the deepest part of the ocean with an underwater balloon, you had to be able to stay clear of the surface, not have any attachments. Well, in the 19, late 1930s, he began work <coughs> on the, uh, his first bathyscaphe, <coughs> FNRS that you see here. That was the Belgian National Research Foundation was sponsoring it. And uh, when the war came along, he lost most of his drawings and the, the, uh, the materials that he had uh, used models for testing, and it wasn't until 1948 that he finally got it all put together and got his first bathyscaphe built. Um, and the French Navy was asked by the, uh, <coughs> the, the Belgian Science Foundation if they could provide a uh, safety boat. Just give me a second here for a little water. <coughs> 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 If you look carefully on the bridge of that French Navy ship, right here, I guess you can't, no, nah, well, right there, that's uh, Jacques-Yves Cousteau. He was a lieutenant in the French Navy at the time. He hadn't gone off on his own. So Jacques goes back to the very beginning of what we were doing. Okay, now what we've got here, and the engineers in the audience will appreciate this, is the distance between theory and practice. The theory of the bathyscaphe was just fine as Picard envisioned it, a Swiss submarine, and uh, he had it all worked out. And he, his first dive off Dakar, French West Africa at that time, was to 4,800 feet. And he used an automatic timer so that went to that, that depth, the pressure switch, it would detect that depth and drop ballast and come back up. Unmanned dive, just to make sure everything was good. And it did, it came right back up. That's the theory. The practice was it was unseaworthy, and it started to come apart at the surface. It just was not very robust. So the French, uh, the Belgian Science Foundation said, well, that's very nice, but uh, we want you to go to the French Naval Shipyard in Toulon and build a more re robust version of this. Keep what you can. So he kept the cabin, the spherical cabin, which is here. Most of the rest of this stuff was thrown away. <clears throat> Uh, they, the Picards, by this time his son Jacques was helping him, <coughs> were, uh, did not get along with the French Navy people very well at Toulon. So uh, they had signals from an offer from Italy, come over here and build an entirely new bathyscaphe of your own design and dreams. So that was the Trieste, named after the Adriatic shipyard at Trieste, Italy, which built most of that structure. And what you're looking at then is an underwater balloon. The long sausage-shaped part is the balloon. Actually, it's a very thin steel shell, very thin, because remember, it's a flying machine, underwater flying machine. So all the more weight you put into the structure of the submersible, the uh, less payload, the scientific payload you can carry. And what did you use for buoyancy? Well, you can't use helium or hydrogen because it's so compressible. You can 
compress a balloon with your hands. We're going down to depths where you know the, the pressure's tons per square inch. And so um, the idea was to find some substance that was lighter than water. Oil floats on water, doesn't it? And uh, also, if you can get a very light petroleum fraction like uh, aviation gasoline, <laughs> for the volume of fluid you're using, you get even more buoyancy. The whole idea is to get payload, just like in any good airplane. So that whole thing is filled with aviation gasoline. Those white zebra stripes you see are just uh, walls inside, bulkheads inside. So if you have to push on it with a boat or put on against a pier, those are the strong places. So you have about 10 tanks. And now at each end of that balloon was a, a ballast tank filled with air. And when you got to the diving site, you just released the air, let the water come in, seawater come in, and down you went. Okay, now you've got to be able to slow down, uh, stop, and eventually come back up. Um, well, because the pressures are so great in the deep ocean, you can't use compressed air like a regular submarine. You couldn't have it, you know, at the, at the deepest place in the ocean, the pressure was eight tons per square inch. Well, that's a a lot of compressed air, you can't do that. So you have to drop solid weight. So you see these two uh, containers sticking down below the balloon. Uh, those were filled with uh, uh, steel pellets, look like BBs, small round steel pellets. And at the very bottom of that tub is an opening. And surrounding that opening is an electromagnet. So you energize the magnet, the, the steel pellets are magnetized and they can't fall. A very simple way of just gradually dropping weight. And if you got really in trouble, uh, like at a, a fire inside, something like that, you could drop the entire tub right away. And you'd lose uh, about 16 tons of weight right then and come back up. And that's all there is to it. The cabin underneath uh, has room for two people. The walls of the cabin are about seven inches thick. Uh, to gain access to it, you come down through the top there where that little house is. There's a tube going down through the balloon and then coming out through here, and there's your cabin. And the front of the cabin here, there is a window. We'll see that in a moment. Very simple device. And what's floating on the surface is just where the difference in those two colors, the red and the white, that's about the water line. So the cabin itself is about 18 feet below the surface when you're on the surface. And this is more of the same stuff. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail. You can see the ballast tub there, there I mentioned. Here's the uh, window for uh, viewing. Here's the tube coming down through the balloon. Uh, in here, the entrance hatch, the interior of the sphere, and then you see your uh, uh, tanks with the gasoline are all in red, and this is a ballast tank here that's filled with air, and on the other end, when you're on the surface. The Picards, uh, after they launched the Trieste 53, soon found that it was a very expensive device for a couple of Swiss to operate. I mean, they didn't have a big institution or university behind them. So they began to look around for somebody that might want to lease it or even buy it. It was first offered to the Royal Navy, and Lord Mountbatten had a, a meeting with Jacques Picard. He was very enthusiastic about it. He was in charge of the Royal Navy at the time. But the rest of his admirals weren't so enthusiastic. Nothing happened. So then he offered it to the U.S. Navy. And the Office of Naval Research, U.S. Navy, in January 1958, uh, purchased the Trieste. It was brought to San Diego, California, because there's a, a Navy laboratory there that uh, is adjacent to deep water uh, with just a short distance from the laboratory itself, the seaside. It was the best of all the Navy laboratories for having this kind of uh, deep submergence program. And you know, basically, it was purchased to be a scientific platform to take scientists down into the ocean. And this is the close-up of the cabin, or the sphere as we call it. There's the window there. Surrounding it are some places where the wiring goes through the uh, hull of the cabin to control various devices, lights and things. And you can see, this is the back uh, ballast tub right here. You can see that round circle, and that's the electromagnet. And this is the entrance tube coming down here, uh, letting you come inside the uh, cabin. Now, it uh, was a pretty small office. As you can see, there's two people there. The one has his back against the hatch, the open door, and the other one that's hunched over is looking out the window. The window itself was plexiglass, seven inches thick of acrylic plastic, but on the inner surface, it was like cone with one end sawed off, if you will. Uh, it was just enough for one eye. 
So it was not uh, very generous in viewing area, but uh, it was a beginning, as I say, seven inches thick of plastic. There wasn't much room in there, as you can see. In fact, by the when you loaded all the, <clears throat> the equipment into the uh, bathyscaphe and, uh, and the scientific mission equipment for whoever we were working with, whatever kind of scientist, that it was about these, our, our space left over for the two of us was about the same as a household refrigerator, a large one, and about the same temperature inside. So it was uh, not great working conditions, but you know, we had to start somewhere. Well, soon I joined the project in January 1959, and shortly after I joined it, uh, I was informed by our chief scientist and my management at the Navy laboratory that we had this plan to go out to the deepest place in the ocean. Now in theory, in theory, your underwater balloon can go to any depth. There's no, no limit. Uh, if you can build a, a cabin that has walls thick enough and you have enough payload. And as we purchased the Trieste from the Picards, it only had a capability of diving to 20,000 feet, 6,000 meters. We wanted to go 11,000 meters, so we had to improve its design a little bit. But one of the nicest things of all, let me back up just a second, is um, that the island of Guam here in the Marianas Island chain is only about 300 kilometers from uh, the deepest place in the ocean, which is the uh, Challenger Deep and the Marianas Trench. So this fortunate fact of geography told us that we just might be able to do that. Remember, we can only tow it at five knots. It's very fragile, very thin metal balloon, if you will, and uh, we didn't know if we could tow, tow it that far, and if we did tow it that far, how much it would be left by the time we got on the dive site. So there's a bit, bit of a risk, risk factor there, but we decided to give it a go. We took the uh, Trieste out to Guam uh, in the summer of uh, 59. We had the balloon here, we had stretched. In fact, you can see the spacing here, that's a little wider, same at the other end, to get more gasoline on board to increase our payload, more buoyancy by adding that. And we had to get a new cabin. So the Krupp Works in Germany, in Essen, built uh, a new cabin for us that could go to the full ocean depth of 11,000 meters. Well, from the, uh, from the mid-summer of 1959 until uh, the end of the year, we were able to uh, uh, make a series of increasingly deeper test dives. Our first dive in the summer of 59 was just uh, about 100 meters in the Guam, at, in the harbor at Guam. But by the end of the year, uh, December of 59, we had made a dive to about 6,000 meters. So we, were, we felt that we were in good shape. Each dive was testing out various functions, adding in equipment, new uh, scientific devices that we could add to the vehicle to make it more efficient. And so by January 1960, we're ready to go. We loaded everything up and towed that thing out there at five knots, going out to uh, about 300 kilometers from Guam. And we got on site and uh, we did uh, divers in the water. Everything seemed to be there. So a few things fell off uh, during the tow, but they were in mission critical, so we decided to go uh, on with the dive. It was a bit bumpy that day. Uh, we, uh, it was, of course, winter time off of Guam, even though we are sort of semi-tropics. Uh, these are three of my colleagues. This is Lieutenant Larry Shoemaker, who was my assistant. That's our Italian uh, mechanic, uh, Giuseppe Bono, and that's Jacques Picard there. And what they're doing is unhooking a one-inch diameter, uh, one-inch uh, uh, diameter towing wire from a seagoing tug. So the other end of that wire is a 2,000 ton ship. So it had to be done very carefully to avoid anybody, because you have to put your hand in there. You had to do it very carefully to avoid uh, somebody getting injured. But it worked. We got it all put together, and we began our dive. Uh, the dive took us uh, about uh, five and a half hours, five hours and 15 minutes, something like that, to get down to the seafloor. And uh, we remained at the seafloor 20 minutes, and the rest of the time is coming back up for a total dive time of, of nine hours. Not terribly long, but uh, we, uh, we were going pretty fast. Uh, why do we only stay on the bottom 20 minutes? Well, what happened is when we landed, we stirred up bottom sediment, and it just wouldn't go away. Now, all the other dives we ever made, you'd stir up the bottom sediment, uh, you'd wait a few minutes, 
get the camera out, get ready to take pictures, check all your instruments, call topside on the underwater telephone, wireless, acoustic telephone, say we're here, depth, so on, and by the time you went back to the window, it was clear. Well, this time it didn't happen. It was like somebody painting the window with white paint. It was like looking at a bowl of milk. And after 20 minutes, we couldn't discern any change in, in the outside visibility. So we realized that uh, we weren't going to see anything on that dive. And uh, we had to get back up to allow ourselves enough daylight to hook that towing wire back up to that tugboat. I wanted to allow about two hours of full daylight. Uh, so the only thing we really saw was a fish just before we landed. Jacques uh, was looking out the window. I was looking at the fathometer and telling him how how far above the bottom we are as we're coming down to land. And he says, come over here, look, look. And it was uh, like a sole, a flatfish, a white uh, fish, about, uh, I'd say about mm, 50, what would I say, let me think. No, about 25 centimeters long, around there. Uh, and it was all white and uh, it was really something to see this. Now the ichthyologists, ever since then, 52 years later, said we didn't see a fish. I kind of like most people know what a fish looks like, but I didn't see them there with me. But uh, anyway, that, I, in fact, that's when Jim Cameron made his dive and I said, you know, have a good time, good luck, find that damn fish. Because, you know, Picard and myself were engineers, so we were test pilots. The whole idea of this dive was not to set a record and not to do scientific work, but to test out this platform, this scientific platform, in the most severe conditions imaginable, in the ultimate dive, to prove that it was safe, productive, and could be used efficiently for, for science. And that was our job. So he's an engineer, I'm an engineer, and, but we know what a fish looks like. We just couldn't tell you in Latin what it is. Uh, anyway, that's just where we landed. Another thing that happened on the way down, and that probably s slowed down our, our descent a bit, around uh, oh, eight, 9,000 meters, uh, there was a great bang, a great big bang. And uh, we looked around, looked at each other, and what was that? What happened? We looked at all our instruments and stuff. Everything looked fine. There were no indications of, of problems with our descent, our operation. Uh, but we just didn't know what the noise was. And uh, of course, if, if the, a pressure boundary like the window or the hatch had failed, we'd have been dead before we heard the bang. I mean, it was, you're talking about pressures of several tons per square inch at that depth. So we, we knew we were OK. We we're still alive. Couldn't see anything wrong with the bathyscaphe, so we said, hell with it, let's just continue the dive. So we did. So from 30,000 to about 36,000 feet, or down close to 11,000 meters, we just continued on down and completed the dive. Once we got on the seafloor, uh, I turned on the lights in the back, because the hatch had a window in it, and I could look back towards the back ballast tub. And I'm looking back there just to see general condition. And there's a crack because there's a window in the back of the entrance tube. It's not a pressure boundary. It's just so you can look through the window in the hatch, through the entrance tube, which was flooded during the dive. And there's a window about in the back of that. And it's a great big crack through it. And that, we found out that's what it was. Now we had a little problem because uh, when we got back up to the surface, we could let ourselves out. Uh, we used compressed air to blow the water out of the entrance tube. And then once it went by that window on the hatch, like a, a, a sight tube on a boiler or something, it, it, we could see it go down, and then you could hear the air begin to run like it wasn't working anymore making, uh, against water pressure. Then you could open the hatch, turn off the air, check it, does the water come back up? Nope, stays there, and then get out. So the problem was if that crack was too big, as soon as we blew the water down with the compressed air and turned it off, the water come back in. And Jacques and I would have been stuck in there for about five days. Uh, we didn't have much in the way of food because, there, of course, culturally, we, we uh, observed uh, uh, you know, our heritages. Uh, he had uh, Nestle bars and I had Hershey bars. And that way we, we represented uh, both our nationalities. But that's about all we had, a little bit of water. So uh, it could have been uh, somewhat difficult if we got trapped in there. Turns out we got back to the surface. We very carefully, not a lot of pressure, put the air in there, pushed the water out turn off the air, nothing came up past the window again. So Jacques said, I think we better get out of here. So we opened the door, got out, closed it behind us. So if it did leak, we we're gonna flood that cabin and went up the ladder and waited topside. 
You know, when you wake up, uh, when you have a bad dream, and, and it's sort of, well, let me get in that in a minute. Um, uh, and then you realize, it takes you a few milliseconds to realize, oh, you're just dreaming, just dreaming. You know, it's so real. And when I got topside with Jacques, I looked around and nobody was there. And you don't realize how alone you feel if you're 200 miles, 300 kilometers from land and there's nobody up there. Because there were you know, two ships when we submerged and we come back up, no ships. Well, it, it worked out okay. There were some airplanes out there looking for us and they, they found us pretty fast. We we're sitting so close to the surface of the water, we couldn't see far to the horizon. It was perhaps you know, one kilometer out there and they were a little further out. The airplane said they're over here and they came. That was that. We did have a stowaway, That's, I showed you that just a moment ago. And it was a special watch built by Rolex. You see that big fat uh, dome on it? That's acrylic dome. Because it's designed to withstand full uh, depth pressure. It actually rode on the outside of the Trieste down to 11,000 meters. So it was exposed to pressure of about uh, eight tons per square inch. So it was a rather remarkable piece of engineering. The, the Picard family had had a long relationship with Rolex on their various dives and balloon flights and all of that. So uh, they offered to take a specially designed watch on this dive. Well, uh, we, didn't, uh, we didn't get much notoriety after this. It was kind of an obscure event, you know, historical event, if you even call it historical. Uh, it, was a uh, it was a cover story on Life magazine, and I even had to write the story. So, you know, we, we didn't have a lot of outside help. Uh, the other thing was that when we went back to Washington to tell the senators and the congressmen what we'd done and that the money was well spent, we hoped. Uh, one of the stops we made was at the White House and President Eisenhower gave us some, some of these things to wear. And uh, that was made a nice day at the office. Uh, and then we went back to, out to Guam and continued our diving program. Uh, in 1963, at the age of 10, the Triestas retired. Had one more mission. Uh, it was, that was in April of, uh, well, the summer of 63. In April of 63, the U.S. Navy nuclear submarine Thresher sunk off Boston. And so once it was, the wreckage was found by a surface ship mapping in the seafloor, they brought the Trieste in to do the forensic study of see if they could pick up any uh, pieces of the sub and bring it back to the surface to try and figure out why it was lost. So that was the, just about the summer of uh, 63, and the Trieste was brought back to San Diego from Boston and retired. It was retired in favor of a new sub, Trieste Two, Roman numeral two, and what that was was uh, we, uh, a sort of a fresh sheet of paper design, we looked at all the lessons learned operating here at San Diego at Guam, many dives over uh, several years, and if you had to start over again, how would you do it for the best and most productive vehicle? And that was Trieste Two. It was built by the Navy shipyard in uh, San Diego, uh, San Francisco, California. <coughs> the only thing here that was different is the depth was uh, restricted to 20,000 feet or 6,000 meters. And I'll tell you about that in a minute. And then after only about one year, one and a half years, the Navy decided they want a really bigger one. They gave it the same name, Chest 2, but as you can see, it's an entirely different submersible. And it was used for some classified work um, for the CIA and for the Navy. And the CIA declassified this one operation. In the uh, old days when they were using these spy satellites, they didn't have digital photography, which is, you know, we send stuff all over the world now in our, our laptop computers. But in 1972, they didn't have this. So the spacecraft at that time, the, the spy spacecraft that uh, CIA had, they had canisters of film. Uh, it was like a, a um, uh, several rolls of film, if you will, but very elegant film and thousands of images inside the spacecraft. And when you filled one up, these cameras took these pictures in places that were of interest to the United States. Uh, once it filled it up, it would eject that canister of film and it would come down through space, had a parachute, and would come down to the ocean. There was special uh, aircraft that had kind of a fork like that on the nose and it would snag that parachute and pull the canister inside. Worked pretty good, I guess. They only lost one, so this is the one they lost. When the parachute failed, went into the ocean at a depth of about 5,000 meters, and uh, the CIA really wanted it back, and so uh, they asked the Navy if they could do it. So that's what you're seeing here. 
they built some special equipment, went out and recovered the canister. As it turns out, the, the crash and the soaking in the ocean water uh, dissolved or destroyed all the film. There was nothing there. Uh, and it was thousands of images. It should have been there, but it was all gone. So they brought up sort of this empty container. But it was a pretty good job of uh, ocean engineering on the part of the Trieste people, about 1972. I said 20,000 feet. What's the magic there? Or 6,000 meters. Well, if you look at a, a diagram <clears throat> of the uh, uh, depth of the ocean versus percentage of seafloor, you find that if you can dive to 6,000 meters, you can see 98% of the seafloor. Think of that. You, you, you design a vehicle, go half the maximum depth of the ocean, but for going at max, half the maximum depth, you can see 98% of the seafloor. Only 2% is deeper than 6,000 meters, between 6,000 and 11,000 meters. So if you're an engineer or a budget guy or a government person has to pay for this stuff, it's, that's a pretty good price trade-off. Yet 98% for about half the cost. Uh, that is the development cost of a deeper vehicle. Now, that, that last 2%, of course, is all the deep trenches in the ocean, like where we went in the Challenger Deep. Uh, and, and you think, well, 2% is not much, but if you take that in terms of area of the, of the seafloor, that's equivalent to the continental United States, half of Mexico, all of Alaska, and throw in Hawaii. So that's a lot of ocean that is not, we're not able to, to, uh, uh, to uh, survey in these days. Since that time, new systems have been developed, and we'll look at those in just a minute. But that's the important, 6,000 feet, uh, meters, and you find a lot of vehicles now clustered today, about seven of them, around this depth capability. Trieste uh, 2 was replaced in 1983 with this one looked, uh, called Sea Cliff. It looks quite different because we didn't need to use the gasoline anymore. We didn't need the idea of a bath of scaff. They, they developed something called syntactic foam. And what it is, it's glass microspheres. And if you put them in your hand, it looks like white dust. Uh, but if you look at them under a microscope, each one of these little microspheres contains a little bit of air, a little bubble of air. And you put it in a big plastic matrix, you know, like making a sponge cake. And then you can cast it in different shapes, you can saw it, and you get the same effect as all that gasoline. And it's a whole lot safer. I used to worry, but I stay awake at nights there in San Diego uh, thinking I had some 54,000 gallons of aviation gasoline sitting next to a dock at the Navy lab, and most people didn't even understand it. And from time to time, I get a call in the middle of the night, they tell me it was leaking, and I get some of my, uh, my team to go in there, and we get some chewing gum or something and putty up the leaks. Uh, it was pretty fragile and, and uh, very, very dangerous. So this, all that went away with a syntactic foam and new materials like titanium where you could get a much smaller cabin or a bigger cabin with less weight. You know, good trade-offs there. It's, it's stronger than steel and it's uh, a lot lighter. Uh, batteries, all kinds of improvements of, in technology allowed us to develop something like this. So 1983, that was the first of the 6,000 meter submersibles. France came a year later with the Nautil or the Nautilus with a titanium hull. And then uh, the uh, Soviet Union uh, built two called Mir-1 and Mir-2. As you know, the word Mir means peace in Russian. And uh, those were uh, built for the uh, Russian Academy, Soviet Academy of Sciences. And then the Navy also built two called Rus and Consul. They were never very successful. In fact, I don't even know if they're operational today. The two Mir submersibles are very productive. I made several dives. I, I dove on the, uh, the uh, ship Titanic. Uh, had lunch on board the Titanic, which is kind of nice, on uh, 3,000 meters below the surface of the ocean, the Atlantic. And then the year after, the battleship Bismarck from World War II, we dove on it. That was about 5,000 meters. Had lunch on the Bismarck. Why did I have lunch on these ships? Because the dives were 12 hours for Titanic and 14 hours for uh, Bismarck. So you, uh, you had to have something to eat. So we'd, we'd just land on the ship. We landed on the bridge where Captain Smith was last seen on the Titanic and had our box lunches. Very nice. Russian cucumber sandwiches. The, the box that came in was as tasty as the sandwich. Uh, then after the two Mir submersibles, Japan got involved with Shinkai 6,500. That's the depth, 6,500. Uh, a diving depth. So now Japan has the deepest diving man submersible and they had that for several years until China came along, of course, with the Sea Dragon 
which could do the 7,000 meters, and it made its 7,000 meter first dive uh, last summer, the summer 13. And now uh, it's very well made. It's, I've consulted with that project, I've been in the sub, and uh, it took the time, 12 years, to develop this program, very conservative design, and uh, it's doing a lot of good work now out in the Far East for Chinese, uh, Chinese marine science. And there it is again. You can see they're all kind of the same. Was it Le Corbusier said uh, form follows function? Well, it's pretty, pretty evident here. Uh, I think that they self-destruct after I've been talking about 30 minutes. It's like the hook in, in on the stage. In 30 minutes, you can't talk anymore. Okay, there are four. Now, actually, Jim Cameron did it in 2012. I was on that expedition with him, a deep sea challenge expedition. He went back to the Challenger Deep. Uh, it was in March of uh, 2012 and made a dive uh, down into the Challenger Deep. Uh, he didn't get as deep as I. I've still got him by 20 meters, so. Uh, I still have the world's depth record. It was just two of us because, uh, regrettably, Jacques Picard died in November of 08. Uh, this is a, not a very good slide of his vehicle, but you can see that it, it's in a vertical orientation. And this is very important. I'll, I'll explain that in a moment. But his cabin, the spherical cabin, is right here. And then there's this window, the viewport right there. These are the droppable weights like we have in the Trias, batteries like we had but it, it dives in this configuration. And that's, that makes a lot of sense because that's the direction you're going. You're going vertically. You're not going like this, like the Trieste. You're kind of sinking this way. This thing goes down like a dart. And so it's a very efficient sub. But one person, 40 inch, uh, 48 inch diameter uh, cabin inside, and Jim is about 6'2 and something. So he actually took a course in yoga uh, to see if he could get in there with his knees up around his ears and he locked him in, himself in for 11 hours, on, just in the shop, in, on land, to see if he could really do it. And he came out okay. He went vegan shortly thereafter. That may have had something to do with it. And here they are, you get an idea of the orientation. That both go in the same direction, but this is a much more efficient way to make a deep dive. And uh, I had the chance to uh, say good luck, farewell, find that fish. That's shaking hands. That's his wife, Susie, to the left. And uh, that's the day. You can see how it's floating vertically in the water. The divers up there at the surface are about to cut away the floating bags that uh, keep it on the surface, give it positive buoyancy, and then after that, down it goes. And he got back and he's pretty happy about the whole thing. His dive, I think, was about six hours. But he got to the seafloor with this very streamlined configuration. He got to the seafloor, I think, 90 minutes. It took me five hours and something. And he came back up in about 70 minutes. It was really fast. And uh, the, the march of technology, this is 50 years after I did it, was such that uh, he had very good voice communications. Again, underwater telephone. But it was very clear, wireless, no connection to the surface. And uh, his wife, we're sitting in the control center on the mothership, and his wife Susie's there, and she's tweeting him <laughs> as he's typing. And uh, when he gets on the seafloor, he calls her on the telephone. Or she calls him, and she's not proud of him, sweetie, and all that stuff. And later, Jim quipped, he said, you know, no matter where a man goes in this world, his wife can still find him on the telephone. <laughs> He had a couple of Rolex watches, 50 years apart. And look at these, they look like ordinary Rolex watches. That flat sapphire crystal actually withstood that pressure of eight tons per square inch. Amazing bit of engineering. So it's half century between what they called the old lady, the one I had with me, and these. There were actually five of these that ran, rode on the outside of his sub to full depth. They were actually tested to a depth of about uh, 15 and a half thousand meters, well beyond the maximum depth of the ocean. And there's the watch. You see that on the wrist? This is a mechanical hand outside, and he's got the watch right there, and National Geographic, because National Geographic and Rolex were the two major sponsors of his, uh, his dive program. Uh, I think the dive program, uh, no one's ever told me this for sure, so this is not a factual statement, hearsay. Uh, it probably ran about $30 million, uh, and they made 17 dives, so pretty high unit cost per dive. He uh, retired it, he gave it to Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution last year, and it's now in Woods Hole, uh, Massachusetts, and uh, it's being parted out. 
the, the Woods Hole Institution operates some man, uh, one man submersible, Alvin, and some unmanned submersibles. And so they're using some of the lights and the, the foam and that kind of stuff off of this submersible to uh, put on their vehicles. Uh, this will never dive again, in my view, because it's a one person submersible. Uh, you have to be fairly high trained, well trained to pilot it. And the, the probabilities of finding a marine biologist that you could also train to do this are pretty low. I mean, they don't want to spend that kind of time away from biology to learn how to do this. Jim is a brilliant guy. He, he designed this thing, he built it, he knows how it works, and he was able to pull it off. But I don't think uh, there are a few people in the world that could operate it and do science because in multitasking when you're down there on the seafloor is pretty tough. You're either a full-time pilot or a full-time observer scientist. So it's, it's a tough go. I don't think it'll dive again. Uh, a more recent project was Virgin Oceanic with Richard Branson and Chris Welch in California. Um, the, their sub is a really uh, a quite different design. It's an underwater flying vehicle. As you can see, it's got wings. Looks kind of like a very spaceship sort of thing. Flies underwater, one person again. And, can, and it's going to be designed to go to the maximum depth in the world ocean. Right now, it's still under construction in uh, uh, Newport Bay, California, and probably will start doing some deep ocean dives sometime in 2015. Uh, they've since had a divorce, uh, and Richard's gone off to do other things, uh, Virgin Galaxy and that sort of business, but Chris is uh, finishing this thing up. And this whole idea of the flying submarine, it, you know, it does exist, uh, and, and it's, sort of pro proven technology, not to this great depth, but the idea of the concept of a flying sub. And you can see here, this line of black dots, that's the line of the capsule that you you're sort of lie down in and uh, pilot through looking through this dome. There's a company called uh, Triton uh, Submarines in Florida, Vero Beach, Florida, that wants to build one of these things, and it'll have an all glass uh, pressure hull. Glass is really tricky. Uh, to work with. It's very, very strong. It gets stronger with depth, pressure, but it also, if you scratch it or anything like that, you have a stress concentrator and it can break very easily. Think about how you make a new piece of glass for a broken picture frame. You don't cut glass, do you? You, you got this little thing, you scratch it, you score it, and you tap it, it breaks right along that line. Pretty good for picture frames, not so good for a man submersible. But the, the wonderful thing here is you're in a hole in the ocean. You can see it's just one big window. We do have submersibles like this that are made of acrylic plastic, but they're limited. Probably the deepest you could go with acrylic plastic would be around mm, maybe 1,500 meters. It just run in, yeah, the, the handling the material just doesn't work with uh, such a thick hull beyond that. But I've made dives in that type of sub, and it's really something. I mean, it's, it's, you're sitting right in the middle of a hole in the ocean. That's the feeling you have. You're sitting in your old chair, and you look between your toes, there's the ocean, up here, up here, all the way around. We call them people bowls. You know, fish bowl, you're outside looking at the fish. These are people bowls with the fish outside looking in at you. And the acrylic has the same index of refraction as seawater. Fancy word, all it means is you can't tell it's there. It looks like it's part of the ocean, so that fish coming in will bump into this thing. They, they don't know where that boundary is. And when you're inside, if you've got the lights turned down, so you don't have any back reflection from the inner surface, you can't tell right where that edge is and where the water begins. You have to sort of feel out that way. It's an incredible experience. If they could do that with glass in the deepest place in the ocean, they're really going to have something. But that's the next wave of technological evolution. Of course, the Chinese are already looking ahead to their next project, and this will be Ocean Challenger in 2020. Um, that's a project that I'm also consulting with. It's the uh, Shanghai uh, Ocean University. And in fact, I gave it that name, Ocean Challenger. They kind of like that. So this is very a very clumsy preliminary uh, design of that vehicle. It'll be about a 12-year, uh, 15-year project. Well, this is the whole idea. The trained mind and the trained eye to the work site. Because in, in the observational sciences, like biology and geology, the scientist goes in the field and makes direct observations. Uh, in the case of geologists, looking at general topography, shape, landform. Then you take your samples with your little hammer and such, 
and bring them back to your laboratory to study. Same thing in biology, you, you observe the natural life in a biome, uh, how the uh, critters interact with each other and, the, you know, and with the plants and all of those living things. And then you take your samples and bring them back. That's not the way we did oceanography in the olden times, and still a lot of it today, as I said in my prefatory remarks, you just sort of reach down the ocean, hope you get something good. Uh, but by putting the trained mind and the trained eye at the work site, then you can see what's happening, just like you can on land, make these observations, and then you can take your samples. We call this in situ, this Latin, fancy Latin term for being there. There are a couple of submersibles. I, I remember I said my prefatory remarks. Uh, most of the heavy lifting, if you will, in the future, in the deep ocean exploration, especially down into the trenches, will be uh, unmanned vehicles of two kinds. Remotely operated vehicle, which operate on a tether, an umbilical. Your operator is sitting on a mothership, looking at the TV screen. I'm sure you've seen this in some of the television documentaries. It's like a, a, a large kind of video game. And there's two guys working this vehicle, and it can be some distance away. And then the second type of unmanned vehicle we call AUV. It's like your drones. We have all heard about today. This is an underwater drone. You program it, uh, you give it a mission, it goes off and does that, and comes back, and you can dump the data from it. Uh, in 1995, a Japanese ROV, remotely operated vehicle, just talk into it this way, uh, came down, an ROV, see it, you can see, well, not too well, but the umbilical coming up here and then up that way. And so that's a remotely operated vehicle, and it went to the bottom of the Challenger Deep. Uh, and it went back in 1998, regrettably, about um, 2004, uh, we're doing a dive in the Japan Trench, and when they brought the umbilical back up, the vehicle wasn't there. It had popped off the end. Now, it had all kinds of devices on it, uh, strobe lights, uh, acoustic beacons, it could talk to satellites. It was positively buoyant, so if everything failed, it would just float back to the surface. No one ever found it. And I have a theory about this, that on the coast of China somewhere, there's a uh, headman of one of the coastal fishing villages is a headman because he has this most attractive yellow uh, coffee table in his living room that makes a lot of satisfying noises and flashes lights and all of that because I don't think it would have, unless a ship ran over it, it had to have floated ashore somewhere in the world. Okay, so that's uh, Kaiko. That was a $17 million problem. They did replace the vehicle, but they didn't replace the umbilical so it can only dive to 6,000 meters instead of 11,000 meters. Uh, oops. More recently, the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution uh, developed a vehicle called Nereus, which is a hybrid ROV. It can either operate as a tethered vehicle, which I just showed you, or an AUV, which we see autonomous vehicle right here. And it's, it has been down the Challenger Deep. Uh, it was in uh, May of... Uh, 2009, I believe it made that dive, and oh, thanks, I'm almost done. Can you hear? Can you hear me already? All right. Okay. And now you know I'm almost done. That didn't mean to tip my hand here. Wakey, wakey. Okay, that's autonomous vehicle, and these are the things that are going to do all the work in the deep ocean, because the fact is that only 10% of the world ocean has been adequately. Uh, Explore it. Ten percent, ninety percent to go, and we're talking about going to Mars. I, I'd suggest that probably better pay attention to this manned satellite that we live on called Planet Earth. What we need is a mission to Planet Earth because it's very important it's for our, our well-being to know as much about how our planet operates as possible, and we're not doing that kind of work. So, as I said earlier, the heavy lifting and this kind of exploration would be done by the AUVs, fleets of these things that can go down and in a, in a very um, uh, orderly way, synchronized way, study the deep ocean. They always require man, always require the research ships, and some manned submersibles, and some ROVs. But the heavy work is going to be done by the autonomous unmanned vehicles, AUVs. And here we are. This just gives you an idea of where we came from and where we're going. This, this is 1995, so sort of before a lot of the submersibles. So we should have extended that one more panel to the right to show the, the man submersible. But you get the idea. Men came out of the sea, evolved, and now we're going back into the sea. A lot of you are divers. I'm sure you probably do that. Thank you very much, folks. That's my program.
course. Thank you very, very much for this interesting talk. Uh, I think we have a uh, time for a few questions. And uh, I would take the first question. I'll give you the first question. A lot of people are talking about the base on the moon in the future. When do you think there will be a base on the bottom of the ocean? I guess a Chinese base. <laughs> right outside the coast of America. Uh, well, who knows? That, that's a, uh, something that's been asked for a long time. There are these underwater habitats. Uh, for scientific work. There's one called Aquarius off Florida in the United States and a lot of the NASA astronauts have done training there because it's sort of uh, a way of training up for the International Space Station. You're an isolated uh, element uh, under some uh, degree of pressure. Uh, you're, you're limited in resources and all of that. Uh, but it hasn't really gone far. Uh, in, in the 1970s, there were about seven of these things all over the world. Uh, there's, in fact, one in Germany uh, called the uh, Heligoland uh, um, uh, habitat. Uh, but as far as, you know, day of life living and all of that, I don't think that's going to happen for a while. Uh, I wrote a, a, um, an article for one of these Sunday supplement, you know, the Sunday paper, the, uh, the general article in 1962 about how man will live under the sea, and nothing happened. So we'll see. Uh, another question? Please. Yes, uh, you talked about the samples that uh, people dive in very deep fight. What did you find at the most deepest place that sort of fascinated you or that you remember or sort of gives you the kick of diving again? Yes. I, I, the question was what, uh, what did I find at the very deepest place that would make you want to go there again? Uh, and I guess uh, there are two answers. There's the political answer of the time. When I was asked by the senators and the congressmen, what did you find? And I said, we found a Russian footprint. <laughs> because we have to keep up, don't we've got to get there first. But that's the political answer. The, the real answer, sir, is probably to find that fish again. Jim looked, no fish, so there are some other living things there. When the uh, Kaiko made that dive, they, see, they could park it on the bottom because there's no people in it. They left it down for several hours. And finally, they got the very first pictures of the deepest place in the ocean, and they sent me a video of that, and there are a few invertebrates, like shrimps and jellyfish down there, which that was no great discovery. But we're still looking for that fish, so that's what I would go back for. But I think that train's left the station in my case. And being an octogenarian, I don't think people are going to offer me those kinds of dives. Sure. Another question? Yes? I, I'm wondering about the, uh, the pressure down there. Uh, you said 8,000... Uh, 8,000. 8,000. Yeah, 8, 8, and to my mind, it would, should be the double, shouldn't it? No, it was, it was 16,000 PSI. Again, I don't have pascals or kilopascals or whatever, it, but it's roughly, it's, you know, half of the depth. You say it's, it's 16,000 PSI, then it's eight tons. Yeah, not metric tons. Yeah, yeah, good call. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir? Uh, the temperature in the capsule, did you have any heating? Uh, temperature in the capsule, did we have any heating? Uh, we didn't, other than body heat, and some of our electronics. In those days, uh, in 1959, 60, electronics still gave off a lot of heat. So running those things, underwater telephone and some of our measurement devices. But no, you dressed uh, warmly. It wasn't particularly cold, really. We didn't notice it. What was the outer temperature? The outside temperature was about two, around there. Remember, salt water doesn't freeze at, at uh, zero. It uh, is minus, what, 1.4? Some scientists here, I'm sure, will say that. But uh, so it was. It was cold out there. But once you get below the the uh, say two or three hundred meters, the, the temperature in the ocean doesn't vary a whole lot, all the way down to the bottom. Last question, please. Thank you, uh, Hans Korea, former legal counsel of the United Nations. During my tenure, we set up the three organs of the Law of the Sea Convention: the Court in Hamburg the Continental Shelf Commission in New York, and the Seabed Authority in Kingston, Jamaica. And that authority is to deal with deep seabed mining, and in particular, the nodules that you find in some places, 
it would be interesting to hear whether you have given any thought to this, because the impact on the water column might suffer from this. This <coughs> mining will not be done by men, it will be machines. But surely you must have given thought to this, because I'm a bit worried that this could damage the water column and also then fish and other species in the ocean. That, that's a very good question. Did all of you hear that? It's basically, the, are we, we should be concerned about ocean mining as it goes forward because the Law of the Sea Treaty permits that. Uh, the, the Law of the Sea uh, Treaty organization set up a uh, international seabed authority in Kingston, Jamaica, uh, and they regulate ocean mining. We, you have to go there and make an application for a mining claim, just like you do on land with, with a government, except this is the whole world. Uh, the Chinese have applied for several ocean mining claims. India has, uh, Korea, right? Japan is looking carefully at this. Um, so uh, it, it, it can be damaging to the seafloor because we all know what happens to, uh, I hope I'm not amongst the enemy here, in deep water trawling. But as you probably know, I believe the EC, uh, European Parliament, has just uh, had the agreement to ban deep water trawling within the EEC, the, uh, the 200 mile limit of the EZ, of the EC. And so they can take the moral high ground now, the Parliament, uh, uh, the European Parliament, and suggest that in other places in the world, because uh, deep sea trawling is, this, is the equivalent of, of clear cutting in a forest. If you could selectively pick up what you needed from the seafloor, but they drag these trawls across the seafloor, it tears up everything. And, and you can see these scars on the seafloor, even with mapping systems. Now, I, I know a bit about Law of the Sea because I was on the U.S. delegation to the third conference. Uh, Elliot, Elliot Richardson, Ambassador Richardson, appointed me to the... Yeah, John I know very well. So uh, I got into the Law of the Sea thing because I'm a sailor. And it was too important to let the lawyers have all by themselves. So I, I tried to bring the sailor flavor into the Law of the Sea negotiations. So I'm, I'm glad you asked a Law of the Sea question. Very important. The high seas regime, which is beyond the EEZ, the 200 mile limit that every coastal state has, is still 65% of the world ocean. It's not really regulated. And I think we have to go back to the Law of the Sea uh, uh, enterprise and, and have better regulation to protect the oceans. There still will be ocean mining, and it is in a limited area. And compared to what deep sea trawling does, I, I think it can be regulated in a way that's of benefit to mankind, that we need the resources. Okay, it's been a pleasure having you here. And I thank you very much once again. And also we have to thank Fred Goldberg for, for all the efforts to bring you here. And Few people have been far down. Many people have been far up on the top of the world. And I have a little present for you as a memory from Travelers Club in Stockholm. A friend of mine picked this stone from the top of Mount Everest. Ah, please. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, now we will have dinner two floors up, and there is an elevator if somebody needs that. So please, come for dinner.